So have you ever had a have you ever looked at life just generally, not your life specifically, but certainly your life at some point, and just wish there was more to life? Have you ever kind of looked around and gone, is this it? Is there nothing more? Is there more than this? Or maybe to take it slightly differently, have have you looked at the life you truly want, whatever that might be, that ideal life you are after and want, and wondered, how can I get there? Now, I don't mean money, wealth, or fame. I'm not talking about stuff. I'm talking about the deeper psychological and spiritual desires we have for connectedness, for rightness, or what the Bible calls righteousness, for meaning or purpose. Have you ever asked yourself, how do I get that? Or how do I get more of that? Well, that's what we're going to explore today. We're going to find the life we truly want and how Jesus is the one who gives it to us. And we're going to start in one garden, go to another garden, and we're going to end with me talking about Jesus and olives. You with me? Okay, so we'll get there. Here's where our story starts. It starts with Jesus entering a garden. Listen to how Matthew records what happens. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Have you ever ever wondered why? Why in the garden did Jesus feel that way? Why was he overwhelmed? Commentators have thought and reflected on that for centuries as to why Jesus was overwhelmed to the point of death. Some of them say Jesus was looking ahead, knowing that his death was coming, knowing that the betrayal was about to happen, knowing the suffering he was going to endure. And they uh, surmise or, or, or speculate that Jesus is looking towards how hard that's going to be and he's feeling the trouble of it and the weight of it. The trouble with I have with that is that why would Jesus then be so earnest in his prayers that it was he was praying so earnestly, the uh, doctor said that the blood that flowed in his sweat is like him in intensity bursting little capillaries in his forehead. I'm like, was it that sense of feeling? Maybe. Maybe it was. Other commentators speculate that what was happening is that in the garden, as Jesus left the communion that he had had with the disciples at the Last Supper and came into the garden called Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, there was a spiritual practice going on that harkens back to the day of repentance that would happen in Israel's ancient times, where they would bring a goat or a lamb without defect once a year, and the high priest would lay his hand on the goat or the lamb, and he would pray and start confessing all the sins of the community, putting those sins on the lamb, the scapegoat. And then they would send that lamb into the desert to die, carrying with it all the sins of the community. So the commentators speculate that what was happening in the garden, why Jesus was feeling this overwhelming sorrow, uh, this uh, being pressed or crushed, he even says, is that the weight of the sin of the world was being put on him. And he was feeling that weight being placed on him. And he was seeing, feeling in that moment what would eventually come was a separation from his father, which might not sound like a big deal because we, we endure separation all the time, but contemplate for a moment that Jesus, who is God, had been united with the father forever and now was going to express in just a few short hours, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was experiencing that separation the sin being put on him, the weight of the actions coming for him to do. And he begins to feel this weight. And the human part of Jesus says, has a prayer. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. He was feeling that weight and Jesus was going, It's so hard. 
I don't think I can do it. But not as I will, as you will. He's feeling this pressure. He goes, God, take it away. So his response, whenever he's faced hardship, Jesus prayed and then submitted. I bring my request to God, I'll submit to his will. And he does it again and again and again. He returns to his disciples and found them sleeping. In the midst of his hardship, he had been given the opportunity for some support and encouragement. These disciples who he had taken with him. And then he had taken three, uh, Peter, James, and John, to come closer with him and to intercede and pray with him. In Matthew, they all just fall asleep all the time, right? Uh, in, In Luke they kind of record that the disciples had grieved with Jesus and were so overwhelmed by the grief that they were just exhausted. Have you ever had that experience of listening to somebody's hardship and pain and brokenness that it just way, it exhausts you just listening to it? They kind of felt that and they'd gone to sleep. And Jesus comes to them, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? This was not one prayer, three seconds. This was Jesus praying For 60 minutes, the same intensity over and over again. So he comes to Peter. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So he went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And then he comes back again, found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. Matthew's very nice. Their eyes were heavy. They were exhausted. Watching their Lord, their master, their rabbi pray about his death, pray about his suffering, pray about what they couldn't understand what was going through. But now Matthew writing in hindsight, looking back, begins to understand. So he's trying to capture the immensity of the moment. And Jesus, a second time, prays and submits. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Jesus enters this garden as a free person, submits to his Father, and leaves imprisoned. He returns to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. And the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And we know as we read through these stories, those of you who are Christians who may know this uh, uh, account pretty well, Jesus gets arrested and so begins his trial, his torture, and eventually uh, his crucifixion. And we're, this week, we're going to dive into this uh, part of Matthew more intently and deeply on Thursday and Friday at our Holy Week communion services in person in the Hopkinton campus, 7 o'clock, you need to register. There's limited space. It'll be online. Uh, a similar, not what's happening in Hopkinton, but a recorded version will be online at 7 o'clock and 10 o'clock on Thursday. I encourage you, if you're in person or, or, uh, or online watching, come and enjoy and step into that experience as we try to understand the emotions, the feelings, and what Jesus was going through in the garden. Don't want you to miss it. But what's happening in this garden, Paul takes note of. And in the book of Romans, he begins to unpack a realization he has that there are two gardens in the Bible where something significant happens. Here's what Paul writes in Romans about this uh, account of Jesus in the garden and what was going on and another garden. It comes from Romans 5, verse 14. He ends by saying, now Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. Right there is pointing way back to Genesis to a garden we all know. Everybody know the name? Eden, right? Garden of Eden. Beautiful garden where here Adam was being asked to obey God in a particular way and he didn't do it. He wasn't good at it. He failed at it. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ, Paul says, who was yet to come. So Paul is now comparing two men and two gardens. There is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. Adam sinned and all of humanity was caught up in that. Which, by the way, that's what Adam means. It's not actually the name of a person. It's a description. It means mankind. 
mankind sinned. And this sin, which Paul calls one man, this sin, man, Adam, his one sin brought death to everybody, all people. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and His gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, does something that Adam couldn't do. He obeys God. And because of that obedience, the gift of God, His grace and forgiveness, is poured out to everybody who was given death. The result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. Do you see the comparison he's making? Adam leads to death, many sins. Jesus' uh, obedience leads to life, leads to uh, a a gift of being made right with God, and the forgiveness of all those sins, even though you're guilty. It's a profound thing happening in the Garden of Gethsemane. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and His gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. That's why we worship Him. Because on the cross, He put to death sin, put to death death. I know that sounds a little weird. And three days later, God said, I approve and raise Jesus to life. And we're told that Jesus coming to life, which I hope we will celebrate with shouts and joy and worship next week. When Jesus raised to life, Paul says, that was the first fruit, the promise of what we will all receive one day if we trust in Jesus. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Do you get what he just said? You don't have to do anything. Because when you do, when I do, well, I won't speak for you. When I do, I mess it up. But Jesus doing it once is my, is my ability to step into a relationship with God, being made right with Him, and find that life I truly want of connectedness, of righteousness, of meaning, of purpose. Well, Paul's not done. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. It's an interesting thing going on here. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. Do you ever wonder about that? The laws weren't given to tell you how to be right. They were telling you how wrong you were. All those laws that we like to, uh, like, you know, we like to quote to other people. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt. We like to do that. But they weren't actually given to us to try to show us the right way to live. They were given to show us just how, ro- how we couldn't get there. That's what Paul's saying. Because we can't do it. But as people sinned more and more, I think he could have gone on like, uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, choruses we have in our modern pop songs. But as people sinned more and more and more and more and more and more, here's the most amazing thing. God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Pastor Mike loves this little word here because it actually means super abundant, like superheroes, like stronger than ever. So, As sin increased, God's grace got more and more, so that there is no sin that God's grace can't overcome. It's just super abundant, powerful beyond measure. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I want you to see this comparison. Two gardens. Here's what Paul is saying. In one garden, the Garden of Eden, there is Adam and Eve, given a simple choice. Don't eat from this fruit. They have all of the trees in creation to eat from except two. Don't eat from this. A simple choice. And if they obey that, if they don't eat those, uh, that fruit and eat all the other stuff given to them, the promise they have is companionship with God, connectedness. But because they disobey, because they fail at that, the result is judgment and death. 
not just for them, but for all of humanity. That is a, the Bible's way of saying you are separated from God, who is life, who is health, who is righteousness. And when you're separated from Him, the only things left are the things that we don't want. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is faced with a very hard choice. The hardest choice of all, to surrender companionship with His Father. And for Him, if He obeys God... It means separation from his father. Tim Keller wrote about that at length. And I think that's a profound thought to spend all week thinking of, that Jesus in his, in his obedience is separated from his father. For him to say yes to God means no to having pre the presence of God. And yet because he says yes to it, because he steps into that, grace and life are the result. All because in a garden called the Mount of Olives, Jesus says, makes the hard choice, and we benefit from it. Now, as we processed this passage, trying to think this through, I asked a question in our sermon preparation. I said, so what? All that happens. That's great. It's a nice theological exercise. So what? Because that's how people sometimes treat Jesus. So what? I didn't ask him to do that. I didn't want him to do that. I didn't call on him to do that. So what? But let's, we just did this as a prayer of intercession at time. Can we admit to each other, just for a moment, is the world broken? Yeah. There's wars everywhere. There's brokenness everywhere. If you think of your life as being the best you could ever have, and where it is now, would you say there's a gap? I'm not asking how big the gap is. I'm not asking you to confess sins next to each other. Just, is there a gap? I see some of you nodding yes. I would agree. Because you see, when Paul talks about Adam, he's not talking about a distant ancestor in the past. He's talking about us. We are Adam. We are distant from God. We are broken. We are fail to do the good we want to do. We, we do the, th the bad things we don't want to do. We are Adam. We are experiencing that same simple choice Adam faces. We face every single day. And some days you do well, some days you don't do well. But, you know, there's kind of this joking prayer you can pray about how, you know, you can get, you, uh, you can pray to God, you know, I've had such a great day. I lived this day perfectly. I have not done anything wrong. Nobody has irritated me. Nobody got on my bad side. Uh, I'm so grateful for you, Lord Jesus. I'm about to get up and face my day. <laughs> because the reality is, you, you know, you walk down you, the, uh, in our house. For me, it's the cat, okay? I wake up, go downstairs. I open the door. The one cat is there begging, the other cat is waiting for the begging cat to win. And then trying to walk down the stairs is dangerous because the cat is across, 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 across. So in, inevitably, because it's so close to me, I don't want to fall because I'm staring straight down to a glass door that I'm going to fall through. So I don't kick the cat. Please don't. I push it out the way. Okay? I do not kick the cat. Please don't take But by that point, I'm irritated, broken. Uh, I don't know what it is for you. How long into your day does it take? Is it your spouse because they were snoring or breathed wrong or didn't pack the dish away? I didn't realize snoring was going to get that level of reaction. Wow. There were, I saw a couple of people. Is it your boss because you opened your email just as you uh, woke up and saw something there that triggers you, that makes you unhappy? Like, I don't know what it is, but we are all Adam, and we see it everywhere, in us, in others, in the world around us, just this brokenness upon brokenness upon brokenness. People try good things, and bad results come. Because we can't fix it. There's no amount of work that is going to fix it. What happens is Jesus offers us hope. The life we want comes when we are restored to God and reconnected with Christ. The language in Christianity that we use is reborn. When you are born again, when you commit your life to Christ, there's an inner transformation that happens. You become 
saved. We talk about being saved. That's what it means. It's being saved in that way. But while we are made perfect, while Jesus and his sacrifice gives us all the grace we need that we never need to worry, we all know that that is a journey. And Paul spoke about it this way. He said, I have the old man on me, and when I give my life to Christ, I take off the old man and throw him away, and I put on the new man, and I'm new. The problem is the old man keeps climbing back on top of me, and I can't get away from it. And so we go through this journey, and that's what Paul is talking about in this garden, a journey from Adam, brokenness, to Jesus, righteousness. And the word righteousness means being made right with God or living in a right relationship with Him, being connected once again. It's not about living perfectly. It's about connection, relationship. And one of the problems we have in the world is that religion makes it worse. Religion tries to take the law and say, just do that and you'll be okay. And it, it's very subtle. Yes, commit your life to Christ, call Him Lord and Savior, so you're now saved. Now, obey all these things. And it becomes a subtle distortion where instead of being saved by grace, we now try to be saved by works. But there's something powerful that happens in, in what Paul is talking about, that when we accept the offer that Jesus gives, being saved, we are invited to live by grace, which is living saved. You know, when we talk about religion making it worse, other systems make it worse too. You know what Winston Churchill said? Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. <laughs> that was his take on it. But what he was basically saying is democracy is not so great either. <laughs> government doesn't help. It tries, but it fails. Other systems try to make it work. So social systems, entertainment, they all have some level of brokenness in them. The only thing that helps is a total transformation by being reborn with Jesus Christ. That's what Palm Sunday was about. Hosanna, save us, make us new, restore us. So how might you respond? I would encourage you to take the response from Romans 6, which is the next chapter after the one I just read about the two gardens. Paul says, sin is no longer your master when you have committed your life to Christ, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. You don't have to fill all of that. Jesus has already done for it. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. So here's what I'd love you to take away from today's message. When we live under the freedom of God's grace, we experience the life we truly want. You want connectedness? You want purpose? You want meaning? You want transformation? You want that peace you desire? You want rightness? It's about living under the freedom of God's grace, which is a relationship with Jesus, and then living that out in a journey, day in and day out. The relationship. Not the checkbox of how many sins did I commit, how many good acts did I commit. No. How, wh what's my proximity to Jesus? How close am I to Jesus in my day? So I promised to talk to you about olives. Do you know what Gethsemane means? It means olive press. That's what's the left-hand side of that picture. They surmise that this garden where the uh, disciples used to frequent, they would go to the Mount of Olives often, it was probably an olive orchard, and in it was an olive press. Now, in that day and age, many of the olive presses were communal. You could come and use them together. And olives would be put into the little trough, and then you would walk a donkey, or a, a few strong people would then walk the stone wheel around, and as it rolled, it would press the olives. And olive oil would come out. What they would do is crush the olives, and oil would be the result. Do you know how valuable olive oil was in Jesus' day? Homer called it liquid gold. He pe he I'm going to mess up this name because I keep wanting to say hypocrite. Hippocrates called it olive oil, called olive oil the great healer. You know what olive oil is used for? It was used for food and flavoring, yes. But it was also used in medicinal uh, treatments. 
The balm of Gilead, ever heard that? That's, a balm is oil poured on somebody. It was used to, for protection. It was considered a medicinal healer. It was used, if mixed with certain uh, herbs or spices, it was used for perfume, for uh, uh, like I- incense and, and flavor, um, not flavoring, sorry, uh, uh, anointing to help, help have you smell nice. I know that sounds weird. Please don't go home and pour olive oil all over yourself. The olive oil we have at home is not the same. But this was used for perfume. They would use it to anoint the dead. And no correlation between the two, but to anoint kings as well. Olive oil was seen as a blessing poured on people. Olive oil was the only fuel that could be used in the temple to burn the candles in the temple. It was obviously used to give light. They would take olive oil and they would make soap from it for cleansing. Now, there's a passage in this uh, section of Matthew in other Gospels. Jesus says, in Matthew, we just read, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. But in other translations, Jesus says, my soul is crushed to the point of death. Jesus is praying next to an olive press where olives were crushed, and he was looking toward a future where he was going to be crushed. He was going to be crushed, pressed down. And what would flow from Jesus? A lot of people wonder why are Christians so fascinated with the blood of Jesus? And let me tell you why. Because we believe that when Jesus died, when he was crushed, the blood of Jesus flowed. And with the blood of Jesus, we got healing. By his stripes, we are healed, we read about in Scripture. We know from Scripture uh, in the Old Testament sacrifices that blood was used to anoint things to, for protection. We spoke about it uh, just a few weeks ago with the Seder. Remember the rabbi talking about the Passover when they take the blood and put it on the doorposts? And they don't do that today, but what they do is put those little uh, tubes up to kind of represent that. That's kind of what she's teaching, that the blood of Jesus is an anointing that protects us from death, gives us life. The blood of Jesus is the representation of who He is, His light. The forgiveness of sins is the cleansing. Uh, Paul talks about the aroma of Christ. Can you get the correlation I'm making between olive oil and the blood of Jesus and what Jesus is praying in this moment? What does He give us? We get life connection with God. We are made right with God. We are received the peace we so desperately want. That inner contentment that we're after comes through Jesus. We find purpose beyond ourselves when we are committed to Jesus. We get freedom from anxiety, from uncertainty, from death. They don't come miraculously to everybody. To some people they do. But for most people, it's an ongoing work of coming to Jesus and saying, I need you again. I need that sacrifice once again. I need to commit my life to you once again. Because the journey of following Jesus is not a pray and done. It's an ongoing prayer every day of saying, Lord Jesus, today I choose you as Lord. Lord Jesus, today you are my Savior. That's what it means to live by grace. So this Easter, I'd encourage you to invite your friends to share with others Not just a Jesus that can get you out of hell, because that was never the point. I want you to share with people the Jesus who gives us life, who gives us connection, who gives us purpose. And that is what he was doing in the garden, making that hard choice that we would get that, and he would take everything that we are getting from Adam. That's worth following. It's not a biblical expression but Jesus is kind of like my olive oil. That aroma, fragrance, that healing, that wonder. He is the one who gives life. And that is worth worshiping. That is worth praying. That is worth reflecting on in this week called Holy Week because it is a week unlike any other week in the year. It is a week where we consider what Jesus did on our behalf.
And I hope you will do that. I hope you'll take part in reading Scripture, praying, putting some silence into your week and into your day to just pause and go, Jesus, thank you for the garden and thank you for the cross. And then next Sunday, bring that gratitude and let's celebrate and praise Him and rejoice. The one who died for us but didn't stay dead. He was raised to life so that you and I and everybody who wants to can have eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. So can I pray for that and pray for us this week? Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful for your Son. Lord Jesus, thank you for being willing to go through that hardship for us. Even though we didn't ask for it, even though we weren't searching for it, you did it anyway because of your great, great love for us. It cost you more than we can ever imagine. And our praise, our gratitude, our thankfulness can never compete with what it cost you. But you never ask for us to compete. You just ask for us to accept. So we accept you, Lord Jesus, and ask you to come and be a a part of our lives. We ask you to come and guide us. We ask you to come and point us to how we might continue to live by grace and how we might continue to invite you to be our Lord and our Savior each and every day. We are so grateful for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name, amen. Christ is my firm foundation.